I just realized I was telling my kids to walk, and I kind of sounded a bit like a chicken. <laughs> it's important for all your safety. Uh, there was one, one quick reminder. Today's offering, this is a Mission Sunday. So just a reminder, all giving that comes in today is going to support our, our missionaries in proclaiming the gospel uh, outside of, of uh, here. Anyways, and then uh, just reminders also, uh, if you're online, you can give at chestergospelchurch.org, and we have the, the giving box in the back corner there. And with that, let's start this right with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, I ask your blessing to be upon the service. God, I ask your spirit to be upon us today, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts to receive your word. God, that you will convict us, Lord, of the areas in our life, God, that we need to give to you, to offer to you. And Lord, that you will encourage us, and that will be your encouragement, your love, and your truth, which builds up in us. God, we love you and we thank you. And be with us today, Lord. It is our desire to praise you in all that we say and do, and are, for your glory. Amen. Amen. Okay, quick survey, and yes, this is a survey where everybody should be raising their hands. I'll let you know that answer ahead of time. Who here has ever had to forgive someone or be forgiven? <laughs> we are unanimous. All right. You know, there are times where I've had to forgive others, and there are other times where, yes, I was the other end needing to be forgiven. You know, in all those situations, at some point in time, there was an offense that happened, whether intentional or, or unintentional, and on my conscience or the conscience of the other individual, the situation needed to be addressed. And if someone was asking me for forgiveness, I had to decide if I would receive that and even allow our relationship to be permanently reconciled or not in such an apology. Then there's other times where no one had said anything and I needed to choose to forgive and to move on versus allowing bitterness to take hold of me. The opposite is true where I was, where I've been on the other side of that as well. We each have had to experience this in one aspect or another. But here's the truth about forgiveness. God forgives as well. And today, we're going to take time to consider why God forgives. And what was sacrificed for forgiveness. Why we need forgiveness. What God's forgiveness looks like. And how can one receive and experience God's forgiveness. So if you would please turn with me to Ephesians 1. And we're going to be going through verses 3 through 8 this morning. Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 8. And please remember, this is the Word of God. <clears throat> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. We thank the Lord for the reading of His word. What is forgiveness? Well, usually the most straightforward way involves banking terms. It's quite literally 
the setting aside of a debt by the one to which the debt is owed. When we talk about forgiveness in this light, are we to understand that, it, are, are we saying then that's possible to pay God for forgiveness? <clears throat> no, of course not. That is not what is meant. But it should help us to realize, like we never have before, just how incredible and awesome God's forgiveness towards us actually is. I know that when Kelly and I both finished school, for instance, we both had racked up what's called student debt. Student debt, all right, that's a, a fun word, not so fun word for many people. And I remember that one of the great blessings that we had had during that time was God had enabled us to have uh, jobs, and we also got enabled us to have help with that debt as well. And I remember one day it finally came to pass where we got to the point where that debt was paid off. And we were so excited and elated. And, and it took forever. But after all that work, the debt was gone. But I wonder what it would have been like if it was simply forgiven. That's not a social commentary, by the way. It's just an illustration. Don't read too much into it. But what would it have been like to have such a debt forgiven? I mean, I think between the two of us, it was probably, what, 60K, 70K, something like that. To have that just up and forgiven, realize the fact that our sin has a much higher cost associated with it. And that debt owed to God for our sin has been forgiven. The debt owed had been set aside, removed. Amen. That's the picture of God's forgiveness. Now I want to go over a few questions about forgiveness with you today. First, why would God forgive the likes of us? You know, I'd start by saying that forgiveness is a, a symptom, first and foremost, of God's good character. More specifically, it's the result of forgiveness being rooted in His perfect love. Forgiveness is a result of God's perfect love. His desire to forgive is rooted in His amazing character of love. 1 John 4, 8 says, Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. God is love. Now, before I continue on this topic of God's love, I need to make it clear that this passage gets distorted sometimes. In some circles, they will say that if God is love, well then... Love is therefore God. And from that one false teaching, we see cultural understandings of love worship, rather than worshiping a God whose love is perfect in of himself. We cannot ascribe a merely human perspective of love to God, because human love is imperfect. And humans often love what is sinful and even evil. So God in himself displays Perfect love, which he is responsible for defining. It is not a human love, but it is a love that starts with him, ends with him, and continues on in him. So when we love, we are to love the way God loves. Loving his way and not just with what we feel. So with that, God loves because he is love. It is his very essence. Love, properly defined, needs an object upon which to lavish that love upon. And he has chosen that we be the ones to receive his love. It's God's desire to pour that out in a way that you and I can have what is called a real and personal relationship with him. And God's forgiveness is a way that he shows this love. But we need to remember sometimes even the most amazing forgiveness can be rejected. You can forgive someone, but that doesn't mean that they want anything to do with you. And for those that reject God's forgiveness, His love, and grace through Christ, well then, instead of forgiveness, there's a judgment waiting for them. And that is the truth. But God's desire is that we would indeed receive His gift of forgiveness and a closer relationship with Him. John 17, 20-21 says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, 
that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also be in us. God forgives us because he is love. He loves us. And he wants us to join in fellowship with him. And this very text says, even in a way that he fellowships with the Father, he wants us to fellowship with him. And when God forgives us of our sin, it is not only filled with his love and his desire for fellowship, but he is so loving that he even takes into consideration the fact that you and I are frail, sinful people. That we are likely to struggle in our human condition. That he desires to forgive us. And for our fellowship to be united by his love. And because we are frail and likely to struggle, he perfects his forgiveness. His forgiveness is made perfect by making it final. His forgiveness is complete. And his forgiveness is final. When Christ died on the cross, Christ said, it is finished. Well, what is finished? What is finished is the paving of the way for God to have fellowship with his creation that he desires to have. We can have fellowship with God now because Christ took the complete penalty for all sin. He paid the total debt on the cross. The penalty was not partially paid, but completely paid. Therefore, God's forgiveness, which is based in His love for us, is also complete and eternal. Our sin has been paid in full, so that we may have a full relationship with God. So what is God's forgiveness? <clears throat> Well, the answer is here and most clearly, most clearly seen in God's unbelievable love on the cross. Christ died on the cross out of God's love for us. So that those that trust in Him and repent of their sin will be completely forgiven. So that is what is forgiveness. But the next question is quite straightforward. Well, then who needs forgiveness? Who needs it? Well, the big theological answer would be, well, those who are under the curse of universal sin, they, they need forgiveness. What that means is all of us. What that means is all of us need the forgiveness of God. There are those of us that have already trusted in Christ, and therefore our souls are no longer under the curse of sin. And then there are those that still need to trust in God. But it is a shared need that needs to be met either by the forgiveness of God, or it will be dealt with by the wrath of God. What does Scripture say about our need of God's forgiveness? Genesis 6-5 says that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And Romans 3-23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. In Isaiah 64, 6, it actually says that our righteousness is like filthy rags before our holy God. I want you to think about that image of that. Our righteousness is like filthy rags before our holy God. If our righteousness, that is the very best that we have to offer, is like filthy rags to our holy God, imagine then what our sin looks like to Him then. If our righteousness looks like filthy rags, imagine what our sin looks like. Even the best of typical human beings are in need of God's forgiveness. Who needs God's forgiveness? Anyone who is a sinner. Everyone needs the forgiveness of God. In this we see the picture of our depravity. The picture of our need. The Ten Commandments we read about in Romans were put there to show us the fact that we needed a Savior. <clears throat> that we needed His forgiveness. Who needs His forgiveness? Everybody. So what is God's forgiveness? What is the picture of His forgiveness? Well, the picture of His forgiveness is grace. God's forgiveness is His unmerited favor. Ephesians 2, 8-10 says, For by grace 
you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It is a picture of grace, something we could not pay back, and yet it was given to us. I remember, on the topic of student debt, I remember the first time I had met some of the, the people teaching in the leadership class, and I learned they were, I believe it was called, <coughs> lifelong learning majors, or something like that. And I still don't quite understand it completely, but I know in the back of my head in that moment when they said that, I thought, does that mean you're just borrowing money nonstop and just taking lots and lots of classes? You know, and, and when I hear that, it makes me think an unlimited debt that can never be paid off. And I thought about that when I came to school. Lifelong learning equals lifelong borrowing <laughs> was, was what went through my head. <clears throat> but it's a debt that Quite honestly, when I think of the idea of that kind of debt, it seems like it's one that could never be paid. Or, or when I think about the, the U.S. debt, even. You know, you and I, it's getting to be such huge numbers that we're having trouble even completely visualizing how many zeros are behind it. You know, we sit there and we think to ourselves, is that something that can even ever be paid off anymore? Well, our debt is still greater. Our debt is still greater. Something we could not pay back. Something we could never merit enough to pay off ourselves. Yet even when we could not pay it back, while you and I were still sinners, Christ died for us. He set that aside and forgave it. <clears throat> Matthew 18, 23 says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. This particular passage from Matthew 18, it's part of the parable of what is called the unforgiving servant, where a servant approached their king and begged their king for their small amount of debt to be forgiven. This is that $25 parking ticket that they wanted to be forgiven. Then the king not only forgives the debt, but he also sets them free from the prison sentence that came with the debt. So not only did the first servant mention here have his debt set aside and forgiven, but the scripture indicates that this servant was set free by the king. Now there's more to that parable that I'm not going into today. But my point is that when God forgives us of our sin, our sin debt is forgiven. And when our sin debt is forgiven by God, we are set free. Free, no longer held down by that sin debt. Amen. And this is what the beautiful portrait of what God does for us when He forgives. We paid off our minivan this year, and we're like, yeah, and we're so excited. Boy, if we realized just how much was forgiven when our sins were forgiven, we'd be jumping nonstop. We'd all be doing jumping jacks, praising God. We'd be so excited. Let me ask you when the last time was you jumped for joy and praised God for the forgiveness of your sins the same way as your favorite football team scored a touchdown. Let's praise God for this forgiveness. Hallelujah! My sins are forgiven in Jesus Christ. And more than that, not only are our sins forgiven, but then we need to ask ourselves, what does God do with that sin? You know, in the banking world, when you forgive a debt, you've got to write it off somewhere. This is what it says in Psalms 103, verses 1 through 4. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. What that text tells us is God completely separates the sins from those who committed them, and He redeems them completely. 
Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. When God forgives, it is complete. It is total. It is no longer held against you. There are those of us that have the experience of receiving phone calls, of bills, and people wondering, where's my money? I can tell you I grew up in a home where we didn't have a great deal of money. And I remember there were times where the phone would ring and mom and dad wouldn't answer. It was better for one of us to answer it instead. <laughs> you know, type of thing. There are no callbacks when God has forgiven our debt. The sin is forgiven completely and totally. How many of us here today could appreciate and experience God's promise of a clean slate, a fresh start, being made white as snow in Christ, in golfing terms, a mulligan? Because God has taken it and wiped it clean. For the rest of the service, I'm gonna, I want to read for you a story. One of the most impactful books I have ever read is called The Hiding Place. The story of Corey Ten Boom. It's one of those books that will change your life and your perspective. Only book that will change it more is scripture. And this is the story about how Corey Ten Boom, a Holocaust survivor, when she came face to face with a prison guard, from the concentration camp that she saw her sister die at. So I'd like to read this for you. It was in a church in Munich that I saw him. A balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat. A brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filling out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along the rows of wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947, and I had come from Holland to defeat Germany with the message that God forgives. It was the truth they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed-out land. And I gave them my favorite mental picture. Maybe because the sea is never far from Hollander's mind. I like to think that that's where forgiven sins would be thrown. <clears throat> When we confess our sins, I said, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. The solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. There were never questions after talk in Germany in 1947. People stood in silence, and in silence collected their wraps, in silence left the room. And that's when I saw him. Working his way forward, Against the others, one moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat, the next a blue uniform and a visor cap with its skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush, the huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the same of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, Ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you were. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during Nazi occupation of Holland. And this man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. Now he was in front of me. Hand thrust out. A fine message, Fräulein. How good it is to know that as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take out his hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among those thousands of women? But I remember him, the leather crop swinging from his belt, I was face to face with one of my captors, and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. No, he didn't remember me. But since that time, he went on. I have become a Christian. 
I know that God has forgiven me of the cruel things I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fräulein. Again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? And I stood there. I, who sins, had again and again to be forgiven and could not forgive. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives says that we forgive those who have injured us. And if you do not forgive their trespass, neither will the Father in heaven forgive you yours. I knew it not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able also to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives. And those who nursed their bitterness remained trapped. It was as simple, as horrible as that. And still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of, of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Help, I prayed silently. I, I can lift my hand. I can do that much. Lord, you supply the rest. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand out, the stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bring tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. And it was in that act of forgiveness that she grew deeper in her walk with God because in this challenging story of forgiveness, she began to wrestle with just how much more God had to forgive us, our sins, and to the degree and power in which God forgives. His forgiveness, His compassion is unfathomable to us. I don't think anybody would blame Corey Ten Boom for not forgiving a guard from her time in the concentration camp. Yet she recalled God's great forgiveness for her, where Christ died on the cross for her, and how his suffering was meant for her redemption and her death. And then she remembered Christ's death and suffering was for this man as well. What is God's forgiveness? It is experiencing his unmerited favor, His grace. We can't earn it because it is a gift to be received by trusting in Jesus Christ. So how do we experience this forgiveness? How do we experience God's forgiveness? Well, God has a plan. We need to first realize that you have a need for forgiveness. Realize your need. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Realize that, yes, you need forgiveness. And the fact that Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead means that we need to respond. His death and resurrection isn't there to be ignored, but there to be responded to. Realize that we have a sin need, a death problem, and then respond to Christ's death and His resurrection. And in that response, yes, then we need to repent. Give our sins before the cross. That those sins are taken upon the cross. 
And when Christ said, it is finished, he took those sins upon himself in his death, taking the penalty of death upon himself in our place. And then receive Christ as Savior. Trust in him. That he holds you in place. That he has taken that sin. That it has been eternally forgiven. And he is the one that will now stand before God when we face the throne. And then when you are forgiven, when you are now a child of God, knowing that all your sins have been forgiven, that now you are a new creation and his Holy Spirit indwells you, you know what the last thing we need to do is? We need to rejoice. We need to rejoice in this great blessing. Hallelujah. You have been forgiven of your sins in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Our God deserves to be praised. Our God deserves to be honored and followed. For he took my sins upon himself. Died on the cross and rose again from the dead. He gave his son so that I could be forgiven. Who can experience God's forgiveness? Anyone who will come to him and trust in what he has set for us. God's forgiveness, the great blessing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning, for this time together. Mm. God, help us not to speak glibly of forgiveness. Just to simply splurt out, God forgives you, and not realize that there is a cost that comes with forgiveness. That there is a cost to have freedom from sin. God, help us to remember that your forgiveness is perfect. That your forgiveness has cast aside all sin. God, that your forgiveness came with the blood atonement, spilling of your son's blood and his <clears throat> resurrection, that miracles were involved in the forgiveness of my sins. Lord, I pray that we praise you and thank you, God, for all your work and all that you do and are doing. And to always be grateful for your unmerited grace that you show us. We love you, Lord. And thank you for loving us first. Amen. One of the greatest things that I have witnessed in churches is when I have seen two people come together and ask for forgiveness. And not only do they forgive each other, but then the relationship is reconciled. How amazing it is that when we ask for forgiveness from Jesus Christ, that our relationship with the Father is also reconciled. And my prayer is that you experience great joy in that. That you feel the lightness of a burden that has been taken off of your shoulders. <clears throat> and that burden was taken because of the cross. So go out and enjoy your freedom in Christ. The forgiveness of your sin. And praise Him faithfully with the lives that he has given you. And share this good news. Don't hold on to this joy just for yourselves. Share this good news. <clears throat> they may receive it as well. God bless. And go in peace. Happy Independence Day.